我们下一场是这个 The Curious Case of Weird Weird Phone Calls in the Middle of the Night， 那是由这个 Sharon b r i z i n o f f 啊为我们带来的。那这一场呢，他是在讲说，呃，他透过怎么样子的这个机缘，然后去发现了一系列的这个门禁或对讲机系统的这个漏洞，然后破解这个门禁系统，使得说他可以任意的，就是看这个这个门禁系统的这个。呃，影像还有就是任意的开门。呃、uh, ，The next 呃呃 agenda is 呃、uh, the curious case of weird phone calls in the middle of the night by Sharon b r i z i n o f f Um, so this agenda、uh, um in this talk, uh the author um describes the uh process in which um the the author exploited uh a series of intercom systems uh to um access the video feed feed from those systems. Um, without authorizations and and unlock、um, the doors. Um, so um, uh, let's. Um, uh, so uh, the 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 agenda will begin. Hi everyone, and welcome to my talk, the curious case of weird phone calls in the middle of the night. I'm Sharon, so let's begin. So. A few words about myself. I'm a vulnerability research team lead at Clarity.、Uh, I'm leading the vulnerability research in SCADA, IoT, mobile, and malware、uh, topics.、Uh, I'm doing quite a lot of competitions or、uh, CD halves.、Uh, I've played in DevCon and Pwn to On. And as you can see on the screen, this is my awesome lab or playground, as I call it,、uh, where I'm researching、uh, mostly OT and IoT devices. So I'm breaking them apart,、uh, trying to poke around in the firmware, trying to poke around the hardware, and understand how they all how they operate, how they work, and how can I、uh, exploit、uh, security issues that I'm finding. So today we're going to talk about intercoms. Intercoms are standalone voice communication devices、uh, for use within buildings or vessels, like ships or boats.、Uh, we use intercoms to transfer voice communication over short distances, and usually they're configured in a closed loop within a building. Intercoms used to consist of a couple of boxes with speakers connected by cables, with an audio amplifier between. Uh, the two units, but today intercoms are far more advanced creatures, and they're packed with lots of functionality. You can see here a couple of examples that I've placed.、Uh, so on the left side, you have、uh, a very old intercom device named、uh, speaking tubes or voice pipes, and these devices are based on two cones connected by an air pipe,、uh, through which speech can be transmitted over an extended distance.、Uh, and it was used mainly on watercrafts like boats and ships. And this is actually the oldest intercom、uh, I was able to find、uh, evidence to.、Uh, in the middle, we have an early day intercom,、uh, which is fairly simple device,、uh, very similar to the tin can. Telephone, where you had two cups connected through a string, and the sound was transmitted through vibrations.、Uh, on the right side, we have the well-known、uh, classic intercom in the form of two or four wires. So, two-wire connection、uh, intercoms. Provide voice communication in one direction at a time, so it's half duplex, and you would need to press a button in order to transfer audio or speech.、Uh, on the other side, we have four wire intercoms、uh, that are full duplex, which means people can transmit and receive audio at the same time. So these are the old、uh, kind of、uh, old slash classic intercom devices. Uh, and the modern intercoms are far more advanced、uh, IoT devices that are fully packed with functionality.、Uh, so, from video to door control, these new era intercoms are no longer used just for audio communications,、uh, and it's very common to see built-in cameras in almost all of them.、Uh, so, again, on the left side we have. Closed-loop IP-based intercoms, which are、uh, used usually inside houses and buildings internally,、uh, so this means they're communicating、uh, IP-based inside a LAN. And on the right side, we have the new cloud-based intercoms, which are trans transmitting data through a cloud or external server on the internet, and from the、uh, external server or the cloud, it tra tra transfers the information. 
usually to your smartphone. And so the smartphone can see the video that the intercom, the outdoor unit is uh, recording. And obviously, since these are IoT devices with camera and uh, uh, audio listening capabilities, these devices are very lucrative uh, for attackers and they're kind of a, a big target and a juicy target for attackers to attack. So enough with history. Uh, now I want to tell you uh, the story uh, that uh, we're all, all here for. Uh, so it all started with uh, one weird phone call from uh, my friend. Uh, it was the middle of the night uh, and he called me uh, with some craziness and uh, told me that he started to receive weird phone calls uh, in the middle of the night and he could not figure out why. So these weird phone calls, uh, as you can see here on the left side of the screen, uh, are kind of uh, non-started numbers. And when, when he answered these weird phone calls, the uh, intercom app that he just uh, installed a few days ago was opened and he started to see a video stream of an office uh, somewhere around the world. And each time a different uh, number called him in a crazy hour. And when he pressed the, the call to answer it, the app was opened and he started to see a video stream of unknown office. And obviously, I was very interested to understand what's going on. Obviously, it's a bug in the intercom system that he bought a few days ago. But why and how can he see video streams of different intercoms around the world? It doesn't make sense. So then I started my online research. And when I started my online research, I asked my friend for the name of the company that uh, made the intercom and the name of the mobile app he installed. He told me uh, it's uh, a local brand, that's what he saw, thought. Uh, and the, the name of the app was too easy. So I just started from there, started to Google uh, and search for YouTube videos with installation guides and how people are uh, setting up their own intercom devices. And I just wanted to see some equipment and some uh, guides of how to install and set up these kind of devices. So uh, I saw lots of uh, different uh, panels, touchscreen panels and uh, outdoor units. Uh, as you can see here, this is the outdoor unit and the touchscreens. And you can see different menus of uh, these uh, mobile, app mobile apps that are connected to the intercom and even people uh, showing how they're configuring their own devices. And then I started to search how can I buy these devices and what are the different uh, device types that are available on the market. And I came to realize that most of these devices are distributed locally, but they're manufactured by a Chinese company named Vitek. Uh, and Vitek uh, manufactures all of these devices and distributes it around the world. So I had a, a fairly good understanding of the logistics of what happened. And we have the Vitek company, which is the OEM, original equipment manufacturer. They're manufacturing different intercom devices, uh, uh, cameras, and uh, touch screens. And they're distributing it around the world through local distributors. So for example, in Israel, we have the door company. And in the UK, we have the CDVI company. And these companies are taking the, the equipment, white labeling it as if it was uh, locally made. And that's why you see in your building a local company uh, on the intercom. Uh, so they're doing this around the world. I gave you two examples, but actually I found uh, many more countries with local distributors that are, are doing that white labeling uh, intercom products. So I started to dig around the manuals to understand how these devices are working. And what I discovered is this is a two wire system. You have the outdoor unit on the left. You have uh, the power supply and the bus terminal hub in the middle. And on the right, you have touch screens uh, that can be dizzy chained. If you, are, if you have a building with lots of apartments, you we want in each apartment to have this kind of uh, panel. So when someone rings on the intercom outside of the building, uh, the right panel in the right apartment uh, will 
be ringing. So I started to look for more uh, videos, more guides, more uh, online information because this is the ascent part of the research. And this is, for example, some images that I pulled from uh, one of the videos. And you can see here the outdoor intercom unit and you can see the home unit. And I quickly realized that the home unit is uh, IP based. So from one side, it communicates with the intercom via two wire system. And on the other side, it has Wi-Fi and IP and it communicates to a cloud service. So if you cannot answer in your home because you're not home and someone rings the intercom, then it will the call will be diverted through the cloud to the mobile app that you needed to configure and bind with your home unit. So I started to dig around these uh, topics as well, how the diverted mode is working, how people are configuring these modes. And I quickly uh, realized that the two wire system is communicating with a, a, a panel, which is a gateway. And the gateway transfers the call through SIP uh, to the cloud. And from there, it will uh, redirect or divert the call to the mobile app that is connected to the gateway. But I was very curious to understand how a factory account is present. So in their manuals, they're saying that a factory account is present and actually you just need to connect the system, uh, set up your system at your home without configuring any username or password, and it will just work out of the box. So. At first, I could not understand how how can it be because if I'm buying my own system and just working with a default uh, username and password, how my system won't be mixed with other systems? And then I started uh, to understand why I started this research because there was a, such a mix. And at this point, I, I thought I understand. I, I was starting to understand what's going on and what happened to my friend. And to explain this, I first need to take you a few years back to Skype. Uh, and if you remember Skype, you had a special bot, a special account, support.com, that you can just call anytime you want and it will automatically answer you and it will tr uh, transmit the audio it receives from you. So it's kind of an echo automatic bot that always answers you and it's a very special number in the Skype network. And I quickly realized that this is exactly what happens here. Uh, VTech on their cloud had a test account which anyone uh, can use to try uh, and set up a call. And you can actually uh, set up or test this account from anywhere. You can test it from the home unit and you can also test it from the mobile app. So if you press here on the test account, it will actually configure the mobile application to communicate with this echo reply bot that will answer you automatically. But this is uh, a SIP network. And so if you configure a device with a specific account and you know the password, which was easy, easily guessable, then you could configure another device with this test account. And so anyone who will try to communicate with this test account will reach to you. So let's see the chain of events and uh, we'll understand what, what's going on. So first we have uh, some, somewhere we have an intercom that uh, someone is ringing on the doorbell uh, because they're at the office and they want to get inside. The home unit that is connected through two wires uh, to this intercom is uh, ringing, uh, but no one is there. So a diverted account is activated, but for some reason in those home units, the diverted account that is configured is the test account. Uh, because maybe someone accidentally pressed on the uh, test account uh, settings. Then what happens is the diverted account is uh, being activated and the call is transferred through the internet through their cloud service to uh, the, the, the test account. But for some reason, uh, my friend's phone 
got set up with the test account and so the call was diverted to the test account which is now configured on my friend's phone. And since he has the test account configured on his phone, he started to receive all of those different uh, test accounts from the, all of these offices. So when he answered these phone calls, he saw the office where some miserable person tried to get in and no one answers them. So this was kind of the, the case of my friend. And to prove this, to test this, I actually uh, set up my own environment with my own um, uh, test account. And I waited for a few weeks. And uh, when I came back after a few, a few weeks, I let it run for a few weeks. And when I came back, I saw lots of different calls from all over the world, from all different uh, accounts, uh, trying to reach the test account which I took over because I was able to log in as the test account and the test account is I was able to find the test account because I reversed the uh, the application I saw what number it tries to communicate with and so uh, it was very easy to guess uh, that the test account is just 55555 to understand that the test account is 5555 and uh, the password was the same. So the same as the username. And if you log in to the SIP network of the VTIC cloud uh, with this test account, the last, the last one that will log in to this test account will override and will start receiving calls from all over the world from devices that are configured to divert the call to the uh, test account. So this was the case of uh, my friend's uh, intercom. And obviously it just opened uh, my interest and started, and I started to, to dig even deeper. Uh, so I asked myself, okay, but uh, can it get worse? So again, I went back to the manual because at the time I did not have the firmware and the device yet. And I saw a section that talks about surveillance mode. So surveillance door station. And so it happens that not only you can reach from the intercom to the gateway and divert it to your phone, but you can also do the opposite direction. So you can, from your phone that is, um, binded to the home unit you, from the phone you can start surveillance mode or monitor mode which actually uh, calls the cloud enters the SIP network and through the cloud uh, it will be redirected to the home unit configured at your home and this was very interesting because the intercom to the home unit and to the smartphone is kind of the, the obvious of how intercoms, modern intercoms will work. But if you can open at will the camera in someone's intercom, this is scary. So uh, this what happened, this what started the, the real interest and now I really wanted to research this device, get the firmware and buy the device. So uh, this was the time that uh, I decided to buy the device and I started to search for the firmware. And as I called it, uh, let the party begin. So let's see what we're uh, dealing with. We have a device. DT607, uh, this is an uh, outdoor unit, a keypad with a camera. It's a two-wire system. It's connected to a Wi-Fi monitor. In this case, I bought the DX471. Uh, and this device is from one side, communicates to the intercom through a two-wire system. And from the other side, it, com it has a Wi-Fi capabilities. So it communicates uh, through their cloud service to the mobile smartphones. And obviously what's interesting here is the Wi-Fi monitor or, or the touch screen because it has the Wi-Fi capabilities. And obviously when we're communicating uh, with the mobile app, it will communicate with this device which will command through the two wire on the intercom. So obviously my research was around this device. So this is uh, a, a two-wire system device which has uh, Ethernet or Wi-Fi capabilities. It can communicate to the cloud. And uh, it's a very fairly simple video door system with uh, kind of uh, uh, SIP capabilities. 
And what I wanted to do at, this, uh, at the time was to get the firmware. So I just started to Google uh, DX471 firmware and I started to look for all kinds of uh, different forums. And eventually I was able to find the firmware. Uh, the firmware is Linux based operating system. Um, it runs on ARM Little Indian 32-bit, and the main bin binary is called DX471. Uh, this was a 11 megabytes binary with symbols, so it was very easy to do the reverse engineering here. Uh, and so I started to look around this binary, uh, what what it does, how it receives calls, uh, how it communicates uh, with different uh, uh, devices, how it goes out to the cloud. So I did kind of this uh, initial uh, reconnaissance on the firmware, and then I moved uh, to research the mobile app. So the mobile app is called the Too Easy app, and this I researched the Android version. Uh, so I downloaded the APK and started to reverse engineer it. Uh, obviously, it's uh, Java-based, and uh, quite uh, fast I realized that the SIP client is LineFone, uh, and it actually uses a SIP protocol stack named Belisip. Uh, so these are the, the two platforms, uh, the firmware and the mobile app that I started to reverse engineer. And I started to ask myself a couple of questions, a, a research leading questions. Uh, I started to, to question myself, what am I looking for? I'm looking for how the authentication is working, uh, how the cloud connection is working, how the divert mode is working. Uh, so I started with all of these questions and specifically, I started to search for the SIP related code flows uh, because I knew that SIP is involved here, the SIP protocol is involved here, and these two devices, both the mobile app and the home unit, are both connected to the SIP network. So I was able to understand that the, the SIP uh, protocol stack was uh, Bele SIP, and uh, it's a protocol stack by a company named LineFone, which is uh, quite popular uh, SIP, uh, SIP protocol company. And I started to dig around those areas to understand the entire flows of what happens from what ha what happens from when you click on the intercom, it's ringing on the ARM unit, and no one answers. It diverts it through the SIP network to your mobile app on your smartphone through the cloud. So this is the flow that I reverse engineered. Uh, so before we're talking about this flow, let's talk about the SIP protocol. So the C protocol uh, session initiation protocol is a single in protocol used for initiating, uh, maintaining, and terminating real-time sessions uh, that includes voice and video uh, for messaging applications or voice uh, VoIP applications. So basically, you have this kind of a virtual telephone network. You have a SIP client in the middle. You have the, the SIP server. And obviously, the goal of uh, this protocol is to make sure that uh, one client is able to signal and transfer audio and video to the other client. So they're all connected through the SIP uh, network. And in this net, this protocol is, is fairly simple. It runs over UDP 5060 and it, it is very well defined in RFC 2543. And initiating a call uh, or and making a call is a fairly simple uh, uh, sequence. So first, one client uses the invite uh, function code of the SIP protocol, and it needs to send it to the SIP server. The SIP server, in this case, is used just for uh, relaying, relaying the, the traffic to the other client you want, you wish to communicate with. So you're basically telling the server, hey, I want to phone uh, this and that client. So the other client receives the message as is, and it responds with, okay, it's ringing on my side, which means uh, I received the call, but not sure that I want to answer yet. And once the, once the other client wants to answer, they send 200 okay, and the call is started, and now data 
is transferred between two parties. So audio and video depends on the application. And eventually when one of the sides wants to terminate the call, they will send a buy function call uh, in the C protocol, which, res re which will result if everything is okay with 200 okay. So let's see how it looks, how the protocol looks like. So you can see here a sequence of, uh, of SIP uh, communication. And obviously SIP, uh, the SIP network has many clients and each client is needs to be uh, unique. So it has some kind of identification. And in order to make, uh, in order to authenticate to the server, there is a challenge, a simple challenge response algorithm defined in the SIP RFC and the SIP protocol. And basically what it does, it takes uh, the method, the URI, uh, and the nonce, which is the challenge, and it is being combined with the username and password. And so if the server uh, the server sent to the client uh, the challenge and the client responded with a response and uh, the server checks the response to make sure that the client really has the username and the password. Uh, so what it means is that the client is really with who it declares he is. Uh, and so this authentication uh, mechanism uh, is fairly simple. It was quite easy to find it in the reverse engineering process. And what I did is I went back to the manual to understand, if you remember, there is some kind of default account shipped with these devices. So I really wanted to understand what what is the meaning of this device. So I went back to the manual and I saw that in case that uh, the, the communication does not work, you can always touch on use default on the, the panel. So what it means is that you can configure your own password and maybe change it, but they are suggesting and they're recommending that if it doesn't work properly, just use the default. And in any case, they're shipping all the devices with default credentials. So I thought myself, how is it possible? Because each device should be uniquely identified in the SIP network. It can't be that they're shipping all the devices with the same uh, credentials. How does the server know uh, and, and I also asked myself, how does the server know that the password was reset? If you're using uh, use default, then it needs somewhat, somehow to transfer to the server that the, the credentials were uh, back to default. And so I quickly realized that something is wrong here. This is, uh, this is a very bad design and probably it can be easily exploitable. So what I tried to do is I tried to collect credentials uh, from all th these different images and all these uh, kind of uh, manuals that I saw. So this was kind of the collection uh, credentials OSINT part. And what I did, I just went over different uh, photos, different pictures, and I wanted to see both the username and the password that are configured in all of these devices so I could have a good understanding of what are the authentication credentials for the SIP networks for these devices. So I really just went through all the YouTube videos and all the photos that I collected, all the manuals, and I started to collect usernames and passwords and to try to understand what's going on, how users, how devices are shipped with default credentials. So at this point of, in time, I had uh, something like uh, 20, uh, 20 accounts, 20 usernames, and I started to understand what's going on. So the Wi-Fi monitor had, uh, so the Wi-Fi monitor and the mobile applications needs to, kn to know each other. So these are two clients in the SIP network and they want to communicate with each other. They want to signal uh, to each other, hey, I want to make a call, phone call with you. So they, they need to know what is the username of the other party. And I collected enough username and passwords to understand there is a pattern. So the Wi-Fi monitor always started with 04001 and then some kind of uh, random hexadecimal decimal digit, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
And the mobile phone, the, the, the mobile app had kind of the same pattern, uh, but it started with zero E. So if the phone, the mobile app and the Wi-Fi monitor were uh, connected, they had the same username, except the Wi-Fi monitor had four here on the second byte, uh, on the second nibble, and the mobile app had E on the second nibble. So they didn't really need to know each other. They just needed to know their own username and the other party will have four or E depending if it's a Wi-Fi monitor or the mobile app. So how it looks like in uh, a visualized SIP network, this is how it visualized. So we have the Wi-Fi net monitor, which is a, SIP, a valid SIP client. And we have the mobile app, which is a, a valid SIP client as well. And they know each other because they're sharing the same, kind of the same username except for the second nibble. And I really wanted to understand where this username comes from because obviously if this is the mechanism all the different devices would need to be shipped with different usernames otherwise it will be a mess but we do know that this system is working so different devices has different usernames but since it's pre-configured on the devices when they're shipped there must be some kind of a unique uh, uh, method to obtain this username, which will be shared among the mobile app and the Wi-Fi monitor, the gateway. So obviously I turned to uh, reverse engineering again to, to see how the username uh, is being derived. And I quickly realized that the username is derived from a, a unique chip that is shipped uh, on these devices. So obviously the username cannot be derived uh, just from the firmware because the firmware is the same for for all the devices. It needs to be a hardware uh, a unique uh, identification. And so it happens there is this chip DS2411, uh, which, uh, which has a, a very nice uh, capability or functionality that it stores a unique 48-bit serial number. So it's very similar to a Mac. Every, uh, every NIC network interface card has a unique Mac. And this is because there is a chip there that has a unique identification that the, the, the firmware can read the ID from and to use it as a, as a unique Mac in the network. So it, it, it really is the same. So this chip holds a unique 48-bit serial number. And because this is a unique serial number, the company thought it will be a, a good candidate to be a username in the SIP network. And so what happens is that the gateway, the Wi-Fi monitor, uh, is reading this serial number from the chip and uses this as a unique username that will be shared among uh, both the Wi-Fi gateway and the the mobile, the, the mobile app and the Wi-Fi gateway. So this is how we obtained the username through this chip, DS2411. Now the question remains, where the password comes from? So obviously uh, I started uh, uh, to think, how can they derive the password? Because obviously it would, be, it would need to be derived from the username somehow with a fixed algorithm and turned out that I was right. So since the username is being read from this chip, the password is using this as a, the username as a seed to a fixed simple algorithm to generate the password. And so the fixed simple algorithm is very simple. Actually, it's MD5. The last two, it's a manipulation of the last two digits of the MD5, and that's how they're creating their password. Yeah, not good. So let's do a quick recap of what's going on here. Uh, we have the VT company that implemented uh, two SIP accounts, one for the Wi-Fi module at your home and one for the mobile app. And these two SIP accounts are derived from the same unique serial that is being read from the DS2411 chip on the DX home panel. And these two, these usernames 
are sharing the, the same data except the home panel monitor account starts with 04 and the derived account, the averted account uh, for the mobile app is starting with 0E. And the password for those accounts are just the last two bytes of the MD5 of this username. So it's very easy to generate passwords. And on the schematics here, you can see the intercom is uh, is ringing to the Wi-Fi monitor, which has the O0 account, O0 username. And when no one answers, it will divert the account, divert the call through the cloud service to the 0E account on your mobile phone. And that's why we saw that all the phone calls that we received when we did the, the testing was from 04 because what actually rings, what actually calls the mobile app is the Wi-Fi monitor, which has the 04 and it represents the intercom. So at this point, uh, I, I thought about how easy it is to obtain usernames and to derive their passwords because all of these devices are using kind of uh, default credentials and and I I kind of find you based on my experience with this device that changing the password uh, changing the username is not possible and changing the password is very difficult and the company even recommends in their manual to restore the default if it doesn't work so I thought maybe we can uh, be imposter. Maybe we can uh, try to uh, to mask ourselves as a different account. So what I did, I did something very, very simple. I, I knew how the password is being derived and I had lots of different accounts. So all I did is open the mobile app, change the settings, the username and the password to a random account that I found and I generated the password to. And I just entered the surveillance mode. And when I did this, I saw suddenly uh, the home entrance of some uh, random home somewhere in the world. So <laughs> it was it was very funny uh, experience to open a camera in someone's uh, home house. Uh, and it was very scary too. Uh, so what I did, instead of leaving this uh, aside, I decided to write my own code to generate uh, QR codes because it will it will be easier to scan QR codes and enter all the all the different uh, accounts. Uh, and I started to see what accounts are really working. So I, basically what I did is I used the mobile app with the QR generator that I built to uh, enter surveillance mode of different accounts around the world. Now, this was a manual process and uh, I'm a I'm kind of an automation guy. So what I decided is to understand the entire mechanism of how the diverted uh, call is transferred through the cloud service back to the uh, back to the mobile app. And to do that, I really needed to understand all the cloud management protocols. So there are three protocols that they VTEC implemented as part of their cloud service. Uh, the first one is for user management protocol, which runs over TCP port 8848. And this protocol is used for registering accounts. So when you're buying a, a new device, it needs to, to register itself on the SIP network. So it uses this uh, account, this uh, protocol to register the account. And it has three uh, function codes. So we have function code one for registering account, three for uh, changing password, and five uh, to reset password to uh, default. So uh, at this time, I understood how can the panel click on reset to default and it will just work because what it ha what it does is just issuing this function called five request over TCP port 8848 and it will reset the password on the server too. So uh, this was the first protocol I researched. The second one was the update protocol, which uh, was not very interesting for me at the time. Uh, just for checking updates. And the last protocol is the user interaction, which is used uh, to perform the login to the cloud. So every time, uh, every time 
you, you want to start a call, you would need to log in to the cloud and you could interact with the cloud by sending uh, some special DTMF codes and reading JPEG uh, data through function codes 16 and 34. So I reversed engineer these protocols and I did some uh, blind protocol analysis to understand how they're working and I wrote my own clients in Python. Uh, and then what I did is I started to pwn an intercom at scale. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the capabilities of opening camera uh, streams of different intercoms around the world. I wanted uh, to have the functionality of transmitting audio and I wanted to have the functionality of unlocking the doors because these intercoms are not just for voice communication, they're also uh, used uh, for door control. So I wanted these three capabilities in my own client uh, and I wanted to do this uh, on any intercom I choose. So the first thing I did was finding users. And it was quite easy because I knew the first three bytes were 0, 4, 0, 0, and then 1. So all I needed to guess is this nibble, uh, the, the sixth nibble, and three more bytes. And it was very easy to, to write a quick brute force uh, software that will just try to log in to different SIP accounts in the VTX SIP uh, network. And I started to, uh, to log, uh, to audit many valid accounts on the network and I saved these accounts because I just brute forced the username and I derived the password from the username. Now, I had lots of accounts and I wanted to automate and I, I started to check these accounts if they're working and all the valid accounts really worked. So there was an intercom that I could open the, st the video stream to. But what I wanted is to see if I can do this at scale. So I didn't want to take valid accounts, generate the QR code, enter it uh, to the mobile app and then see if it's working. I wanted to scan the entire intercom, the entire network and receive video streams of all these intercoms. So I asked myself, can I fully automate this, the entire process? And to do that, I needed to understand how data is transferred, so how media, audio and video is transferred on, on these calls. So I needed to understand the multimedia protocol stack, how it's working. So I need to understand how the signaling is working using the SIP protocol, how metadata of what ports are, are being listened for audio and video. I need to understand how the quality of service protocols uh, are working and the media itself, which is the audio and video and how to decode them. So obviously I started with uh, the SIP, the signaling, and this protocol, uh, we've talked about this uh, before, it's uh, on UDP uh, 5060, and it's a fairly simple protocol, textual based uh, like HTTP. And what it does uh, is signaling. So it, uh, it, tells, it, ring, it tells the other party that we want to start communicate. So what happens is when you open the surveillance mode, what will happen is the mobile app, which is authenticating inside the SIP network will send the signaling request, the invite request to the Wi-Fi monitor, which is also connected to the SIP network and will uh, basically say that it wants to start a session. Now, it's not just open a session, they want to transfer audio and video. So uh, for that, uh, we need to transfer some data. One of one of the capabilities of SIP is transferring DTMF signaling. So we can actually transfer uh, data over SIP. So uh, intercoms, when you're pressing the keypad and the, the key is correct, the door will open. So if we want to open the door remotely, we can signal the special codes over the SIP network. So for example, if we want to start the SIP call and open the camera, we would need to send through SIP the correct monitor code that will open the camera and start uh, streaming video. So how we will do this is we will use SIP and we will signal the different uh, 
the different numbers or uh, letters. So in this case, we're signaling one, zero, 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 hash, and it will it will reach the Wi-Fi module, and the Wi-Fi module will convert it to DTMF signals through the two-wire system to the intercom. So that's how we will open the camera on the the intercom itself. So again, SIP is used to signal and to send DTMF codes to the intercom to start some kind of functionality on the outdoor in the intercom itself. The next protocol I need to understand was SDP, which is Session Description Protocol, and this protocol uh, actually coordinate the ports that the data will be transferred on. So you can see here that SDP com uh, coordinates the audio ports and the video ports that will be, tr audio and video data will be uh, transferred through. The next protocol is a real-time transport control protocol, which transfers information out of the band, out of band information about statistics and the control information for the RTP session. And RTP session is real-time transport protocol, which transfers uh, audio and video data. So this is where the, the real data is being transferred from the mobile app to the Wi-Fi module that are both connected through the SIP network. So let's see an example. This is a pickup I recorded uh, when I did all my, uh, my uh, trial and errors. Uh, so the first part is using SIP to set up a call. The next part is SIP uh, answering a call. And after that, information about ports, what, what are the audio ports and the video ports uh, um, are being shared. And then we have the video, which starts with a blue screen because it only opens, uh, the, the Wi-Fi monitor only opens uh, the, the video stream, but it's not the, the real stream from the intercom because we did not signal the intercom to open the camera yet. So at the first we have just blue screen and only after signaling the the correct code, the monitor code through the SIP protocol, only then the the video stream, the real video stream of, from the intercom will be transferred with real image. So at this point in time, we only have blue screen because we did not signal the intercom to open the camera yet. And after that, we have the authentication. So we're sending the authentication function code uh, to, to the server. And only then we have a, a live video because only then we can really communicate with the device and everything is authenticated. Let's see how it's working in this diagram that I've prepared. So at first we have uh, the SIP uh, register account. So we, we need to log in into the network, the SIP network, as a mobile app, as imposter in the mobile in, in the SIP network. The VTEC gateway uh, or the cloud server answer is OK. And then we want to signal the other party that we want to start communicating with. So we're sending a SIP invite request. And it reaches the home unit. So the, the SIP invite reaches the home unit, which responds with OK. Then we're authenticating through uh, TCP 8850 to the cloud, which means we are uh, a valid account in the network. And the cloud uh, confirms, so uh, it's OK. And then we're signaling the DTMF codes to open the camera on the intercom unit. And only then we're starting to receive RTP data, which is video and audio. So I've prepared here, uh, this is my automation that does all of this. So first we're finding a username, a valid username, and we're registering into the SIP network, starting RTP server on our side, because this is our automation that uh, mimics the entire process. Uh, and then we're uh, establishing a call sending a SIP invite, coordinating ports and codecs for the audio and video, and starting RT, RTP data transfer. So what happens so far is we pressed the surveillance mode, and now we have a blue screen at this time because we did not uh, send any DTMF signals 
to the to the intercom. So currently, uh, there is no real image to send to us. And only after we're authenticating and sending signal DTM and we're signaling DTMF codes, only then the camera on the intercom itself is opened and the data is transferred through the two wire to the gateway, the home unit, and diverted through the SIP network through the cloud to our mobile app. And finally, we have image. Uh, so here is an example of different uh, different intercoms that I was able to interact with. As you can see, uh, my automation scanned a lot of intercoms and I was able to open uh, camera streams uh, for a lot of intercoms around the world. And I did not really uh, discuss it uh, uh, thoroughly, but through the SIP, I was able to receive the real, the external IP address of these devices. So I was able to map the country of which these devices are located in. So as you can see here, uh, I was able to find lots of devices here. Uh, the account is uh, 222, but I, I was able to find lots of devices from Germany, Europe, uh, and actually all over the world. So let's see a short demo of how it looks like in real. Uh, so first, first, this is the, the automation. So as you can see, uh, I have all the automation discussed running. And what it does is logging into the SIP network, uh, authenticating, sending uh, sending uh, all, the, all the relevant commands to authenticate and then starting to listen on ports, receiving data. And finally, we will have our uh, video stream being transferred to us. We will decoded uses using the codex that were co coordinated in the SDP. And finally, we will have our video stream. So here is an example. And what we receive is something like this. Lots of video streams being transferred to us from all around the world. Okay, this was our demo. <laughs> uh, so we were able to pawn all the features of the intercoms were able to open camera streams and were able to unlock the door through uh, SIP signaling and also we were able to transfer audio uh, at scale. So we kind of opened the cameras for lots of devices around the world. Now, obviously, we uh, we tried to do a responsible disclosure, but it was kind of difficult. We sent an email to the company saying, hey, uh, we found a design flow, this security design flow, and we want to uh, report to you in a responsible manner. And we sent another email and another email and another email. They ignored us. Uh, so we really tried to disclose it to the vendor. Uh, we started in April. Uh, we sent multiple emails. We even called them, uh, but we could not receive any, any response. And we even reported this to CertIL. Uh, which is the third of Israel, but uh, they failed at uh, communicating with the vendor too. So uh, we could not do anything and uh, we're just releasing this research as is. So to sum up, uh, a better authentication design flow allowed us to remotely control VTEC intercoms all around the world. Uh, it was easy to guess account ideas. We also it was easy to collect account IDs because they're based on the serial in the DS2411. Uh, it's like having a username based on your MAC address, which don't do that. Uh, known password abbreviation algorithm was uh, was in use from uh, the, the username. Uh, a cloud management protocols uh, allows password override to default uh, without any kind of uh, external authentication mechanisms. And by taking all of this, we're able to create an automation that will 
take video streams from different intercoms around the world and we can unlock doors, open camera strings and play sounds on these devices. The company did not reply to our disclosure efforts. We tried multiple times. We emailed them, called them. We even tried to involve third organizations, but we were not successful at communicating them. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. And I hope that one day uh, we will add S to IoT. Thank you. 好，那我们谢谢 Sharon 带来这个精彩的演讲啊！这场真的就是让我们就是发现说，这个硬体厂里面这是什么事情不该做，就是这个今天这个案例真的是什么不该做的事情几乎都做了，各种呃无脑的漏洞，然后最后被漏洞回报的时候还完全不鸟这个研究员，这真的是脑洞大开。对，好，那我们就谢谢这个 Sharon 的精彩的演讲。Uh, we thank Sharon again for uh, the great um, uh, talk.